It's great to have each, each of you. Some of these people over here didn't get to come today. <laughs> But more and more are coming, and it's really refreshing for us as your staff team to see you here in this place. Thank you so much. What a wonderful day we have today, and I want you to just join me right now in a time of prayer for this service. Lord, we do give you praise and honor for another day of life. And we ask you to guide us in just the right way to live this another day of life. Thank you for the life on earth and an eternal life in heaven. Help us to be concerned for the whole wide world, but not to neglect, not to neglect the neighbor across the street. Let us worship the King with our singing and learn from your word today. Be with our pastor as he preaches and teaches and be here with your Holy Spirit in this service. This is our prayer and we pray in the name of Jesus who saves. Amen. I want you to sing like you really think you can sing. Just sing if you don't one of my choir members every once in a while comes by and says, I, I missed a note. And I, I, I remember that, but God knows correct notes. And he heals that, those incorrect notes as he listens to them. He'll, and I want you to stand with me and give it your best to sing praises to our Lord. Since Jesus came into my heart. You stand with me, please, if you can.
to be a children's hymn, but we are God's children regardless of age. Sing this song. I think you'll know it. Jesus loves me, this I know. sing a new setting of how great thou art. It, it's really a beautiful, beautiful setting. You listen as we sing. You may be seated.
morning. I want to greet all of you and just to say how happy I am to see all of you. And today we have for the first time someone ever entering a church or building. Little Eloa, she's 43 or 44 years old and she's here today with Robson and Simone. Pequena Eloá, 43 dias, 44 dias, primeira vez vindo num, numa igreja. Welcome, welcome. Robson and Simone are, are some of our ESL students. We don't have ESL classes, but they're here. Students are here and are happy to see them. Amos chapter 9 mentions one of God's promises to the people of Israel. And he says, this, uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. I just moved to a new house. Thanks to some folks here, Gary, Roll, and others. And when we moved to this new house, my wife said, we need to put some grass here in this backyard. And I said, one day, I'll do that. <laughs> the day came. The day came. So last Friday, I worked very hard. We had some sod and it was a nice grass. It is so good when we see a promise being accomplished, being realized. And God has so many promises that he gave us. And little by little, they're happening in our lives. What are the promises that God has given you? Trust, trust that he, he will do what He promised. During this time of COVID, perhaps you are wondering what's going to happen. I just want to tell you, remember God's promise. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because we can come to your presence through worship, through singing, through listening, through our prayers. And we are in front before a God that not only makes promises, but a God that can fulfill each one of them. And we thank you, God, for all the promises that you have given those who have already experienced and those that we will experience in the future. I pray for every person here this morning, God. And perhaps you have a promise to each one of us. My prayer, God, is that your promise of giving hope and a future to each one of us, we will experience, if not now, in the near future. If not now, Lord, in heaven, we know that all the things that you have promised, they're going to be reality. So I pray, God, that the promises of healing, the promises of comfort, the promises of your presence will be experienced by each one of us, even those who came this morning, perhaps longing to hear a word from you, longing to receive a word of comfort, a word of guidance, direction. We believe, God, that your promises are real, and you are going to listen to our prayer and be faithful to your own promises. We bring to you, God, this morning our friends from our community, especially those who right now are in a, such a need of your help, of your care. We remember Jim Ray, Lord, battling a cancer. God, I pray that your good hand will be with him, that you will help him, heal him, comfort him, give him hope. We pray now for Stephanie Blumer, Lord. Again, may your good hand be with her as she goes also through a time of, of uh, illness. May your good hand be with her and those who are taking care of her. Maybe we have friends, family members who are suffering. We all have friends or people that we know that are going through the, the virus right now. We pray for healing, God. We pray that your good hand will touch each one of them. We also want to praise God because we can bring these names to your hands. And we want to praise God for those who are making sacrifices so that we can be healthy. Those who are making sacrifices so that we can have comfort. We praise you, God, for those who are working hard, 
risking their own lives to save others. So we pray for every doctor, every nurse, every hospital worker, God. Those, Lord, who are in a battlefield right now, in the front lines, Lord, we ask for protection. We ask for encouragement. We ask them, Lord, that you will somehow surround them with your love. We pray for those, God, that are uh, studying hard to find a cure, a vaccine for this uh, virus, Lord. We pray, God, that you will impart wisdom and insight, and pretty soon we will say that this is over, Lord. We trust you, Lord, and we pray, God, that no matter who gets the credit, Lord, that we will see the healing coming. We pray for this world that longs for justice and longs for peace. Lord, in a, a time that is so confusing, when so many different opinions and ideologies are coming into play, we ask your guidance, Lord, to this nation, to our authorities, to our police force, to our people in the streets, Lord, so that we will achieve the justice the way you want, peace the way you want, Lord, because your will is that we all live in peace, and we pray for that. We pray, God, and we thank you for those who are serving in this congregation, for those who came this morning. We pray that the word that, that uh, you're going to give us this morning will be refreshing, will be comforting, will be inspiring, will be changing, transforming in our lives. And we give you the honor and the glory now and forever. Amen. 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 And thank you, Pastor Jerison, for beautiful prayer that leads us to the throne of grace and gets us in touch with our Heavenly Father. It is so good to see you this morning. Welcome to this place, seeing faces that uh, we haven't seen in a while. We welcome you back. We welcome those of you who have been coming over the past few weeks since we reunited in this place. Uh, we're grateful, aren't we, that God gathers us together and we can be his people in this place. We welcome you here. What a great opportunity to worship together today. Thanks to all who have led us thus far. Well, we are continuing our sermon series entitled Unexpected, Unexpected. And as you know, we are discovering uh, encounters that Jesus had with specific people uh, within the context of the Gospel of John, or as they are reported in the Gospel of John. So thus far, we have encountered what we called unexpected inclusion, an outcast woman who by the grace of God, through Christ Jesus, was included in his plan, included in his kingdom. Then last week, a sick man discovered an unexpected remedy an unexpected healing, an unexpected cure. Today, we look to a crowd of people and discover an unexpected provision. John, the sixth chapter, a very familiar story, one that uh, we have listened to and learned from since we were children, haven't we? John, the sixth chapter, beginning with Verse 1, as you are able, you may stand with me as we read the word. John chapter 6, verse 1, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that all these people may eat? He said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Mark that down in your Bible. That's not the sermon, but mark it down, underline it, circle it. Jesus always knows what to do. Always knows what to do. 
And right now he's helping me find my place. (laughs) Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. And Father, bless your word to our lives. Speak it clearly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, the backstory of this unexpected scene that unfolds before us today is summarized in two words by John, the author of this gospel. Those two words are the first two words in the chapter, after this, after this. If you take a look at this passage and the parallel passages in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, by the way, this, uh, with the exception of the resurrection, is the only miracle reported in all four Gospels. Along with the resurrection, the only miracles reported in all four Gospels. So as you look at those parallel accounts, you find out what it means when John says, after this. According to Matthew's account, it is after the rejection of Jesus in Nazareth. Herod has heard that his fame is spreading, the pressure is on politically, And Mark's gospel tells us Jesus withdrew by a boat to a desolate place to be by himself. Then in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, we find that this event occurs after a successful healing and preaching ministry by the disciples who had been sent out (coughs) two by two. And Jesus asked them to come away with him to a, what scripture says is a desolate place and rest a while. So what we learn is that after this, after these things, Jesus intended to withdraw, to pray, to celebrate, to visit with his disciples. Instead, according to John's gospel, he was spotted and followed by the crowds. As a matter of fact, they got there ahead of him. And according to the gospel accounts, when Jesus arrived at his chosen spot for what he thought was going to be solitude, everywhere he looked, he saw people with great need. Everywhere he looked. Sixth chapter of the Gospel of John tells us about people who needed healing, people who needed food, people who needed peace, people who needed quiet, people who needed protection, people who needed spiritual understanding, and yes, even people who needed a Savior. Everywhere Jesus looked, he saw people with great needs. They were everywhere. And here's what we've learned through the brief three weeks of this series. We've said it over and over. We'll say it 
several more times. Jesus was compelled by his character, by who he is, to care for them and to provide for their deepest needs. And so because of who Jesus is, instead of focusing on his own need for retreat and his own need for solitude and his own need to regroup, he began to minister to the crowd that gathered around him. Again, Matthew's gospel reports that he had compassion on them and healed the sick. Mark's gospel reports he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Luke's gospel reports that he welcomed them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed their diseases. And then we have this remarkable account in the gospel of John of how Jesus met all of the needs in that crowd. This is a two-point sermon. Aren't you glad? You've also noticed there are several sub-points. We'll make it. Point number one, don't miss this. This gospel story simply wants to tell us God provides for our every need through Christ Jesus. God provides for our every need through Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul affirms it, Philippians 4.19, what does he say? My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This gospel story simply tells us God provides for every single need that we might have through Christ Jesus. So what does that mean exactly? What do we learn from this passage of Scripture? First of all, we learn that God provides for our needs when life is normal and our need is ordinary. When life is normal and our need is ordinary. Now, I might want to ask, when was the last time life was normal for you? We haven't seen much normal lately. But even in the midst of our new normal, we know that there are certain needs that are just ordinary. They are recurring. They are over and over. They are basic, like food and water and sustenance. And it doesn't matter what normal looks like, those needs will remain consistent in our life. Now, as we read verses 1 through 14, we discovered that there were people in this crowd who had extraordinary needs. There were sick people. There were people who could not walk. There were people who were emotionally distressed. There were all sorts of people with all sorts of needs. But then, long about dinner time, The extraordinary gave way to the ordinary. And people who were tired, who had traveled great distance, who had listened to a long, long sermon, began to get hungry. If you you want to know what that looks like, just... Wait till about 11.30. You'll see it right here today. The basic need of hunger took over. And, and so Philip becomes concerned. One of the disciples and said, where in the world are we going to get money to buy food for this many people? If we took two-thirds of an annual salary, we would not be able to buy enough to even give them just a little bit. And, And Jesus posed the question to Philip, not because he wanted an answer, but because he wanted to test Philip. The Bible says Jesus already knew what he was going to do. 
Now, this is the same Jesus, by the way, who spoke in Matthew. Do not be anxious about what you will eat or what you will wear or what you will drink. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these other things will be added to you. So in this miracle, this unbelievable story of uh, two fish and five loaves of bread that are translated into an all-you-can-eat buffet, the feeding of 5,000 men plus women and children. Can you believe that? There, there perhaps were up to 20,000 people on that hillside, and Jesus fed them all. And it demonstrates to us very simply that God is interested in meeting the basic material needs of people. He created us for a loving relationship with Him, and He created us to depend on Him in every situation, even in the normal, ordinary situations of life. When my life is just normal, and when my needs are just ordinary, bread and water, Jesus is still in charge of meeting my needs. Great Methodist preacher Charles Allen told a familiar story of orphans uh, during the era of World War II. At the end of the war, orphaned children were gathered into institutional camps where they could be cared for. The children were well-fed and nourished, something that had been missing for some time in their lives because of the war. But those who cared for them noticed that even though they were well-fed and even though they were nourished, they were not sleeping, and they were generally nervous and anxious about life. So someone made a unique discovery. Each night as the orphaned child was laid in their bed and just as they were about to doze off, a piece of bread, a slice of bread was placed in their hand so that they could hold on to the bread knowing they would have it in the morning. The assurance of tomorrow's bread relieved the anxiety, relieved the nervousness, gave them the confidence that allowed them to rest. Through Christ Jesus, God has placed in our hands today's bread and tomorrow's bread. We can be confident. Jesus will meet all of our needs. When life is normal and our needs are ordinary, the second thing we learn, Jesus will meet our needs when life is messy and your need is overwhelming. How long has it been since your life was messy? I'm I'm a mess right now. and, And some of you can see it and some of you can't. Uh, there's at least one person in the room who knows I'm a mess. <laughs> Life ever get messy for you? It did for Jesus and the disciples. Uh, as you read, look at verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come, take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The affirmation here is life is not always normal. It sometimes gets messy with problems and issues and threatening storms. So in verse 15, we find the crowd who has just witnessed this great miracle coming to pressure Jesus into becoming king. They are ready at this moment for the Messiah to lead the revolt against Rome. 
they are ready to force him. They don't know it, but they're ready to force him to act outside of God's will. It is a messy situation. Verse 16, we learn that Jesus, knowing the pressure that will be put on the disciples to join the rebellion, sends them away. Then look at verse 18. Things really get messy. He puts them in a boat, sends them away. The sea, verse 18, became rough with a strong wind that was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. Life gets messy. Jesus delivers his disciples in the midst of their mess. If you want to write down something and paste it to your refrigerator, that would be a good line. Jesus delivers in the midst of a mess. Always. You can count on it. When life is messy and when your need is overwhelming, just as it was for the disciples in the midst of a storm, Jesus meets that need. In 1957, a boy in the small rural community of Lewisburg, Tennessee, ever heard of it? In Marshall County, realized his lifelong dream. His life had not been very long at that point, but he still had a dream. He got a pair of cowboy boots, a brand new shiny pair of cowboy boots. They were bought so that he could wear them to a cowboy birthday party that was being held at the Marshall County Recreation Center. A big party, a fancy party, a dress-up party, brand new boots, Wild Bill Hickok pistols, and a Hopalong Cassidy hat. I was ready. <laughs> Only one problem. The boots were new. The soles were slick. The Marshall County Recreation Center floor had been freshly waxed. Every time I took a step, I went to the floor. <laughs> Every time. Not able to do this, try to do that on the floor. Try to take a long step on the floor. I'm sure that those who saw it would still report it as the most pitiful thing they've ever seen in their life. <laughs> But even more pitiful, my mother reports that at the end of the day when she came to pick me up at the end of the party, I was standing in the middle of the room holding on to the pole that supported the roof of the Marshall County Recreation Center. Reports are that I had been there for about an hour and a half. Not on the floor. Things only got better when my mother walked across the floor, took me by the hand. I was going to say walk me out, but I couldn't stand up. She dragged me out to safety. I don't know why I'm compelled to tell that story. I think in 40-something years of preaching, I have never told that story to anybody in public. <laughs> but, but it seems to resonate with me at this point. Have you ever been in a place where you couldn't put one foot in front of another? Have you ever been in a place where every time you tried to even shuffle or take a small step, 
you wound up on your best intentions. Have you ever been in that spot where all you could do to survive is hold on to something? Jesus is walking toward you in the midst of that mess. He is coming to you. He's going to extend his hand. And if he can walk you out, he will walk you out. But if he needs to drag you out, he will drag you out. If he needs to carry you out, he will carry you out. Jesus will meet your needs when life is messy and overwhelming. Third thing we see in this passage, Jesus meets our needs when life is meaningless and our need is eternal. When life is meaningless and our need is eternal. Now here is the essence of this passage of Scripture. And there are a lot of verses here from verse 22 to verse 40, so we'll have to summarize. But, but as you trace this story, You'll see that this crowd was fed by Jesus and they pursued him. They wanted to make him king. And in the midst of it, he removed his disciples from this kind of temptation. And they encountered a mess in their lives that had to be resolved. And so when you come to verses 22 and following, particularly in verse 25, you'll find that the crowd is pursuing Jesus, they want more of what he has given them. So they follow him to the other side of the lake. And they quickly reveal the real motive of their life. Look at verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So these people, who are just like us, by the way, follow Jesus. They are afraid, down deep in their souls, they're not afraid that they've missed some spiritual blessing that Jesus wants to bestow on them. They're afraid that they might have missed breakfast. Dinner was great. But what about now? What's next? To those folks and to many of us, life has been reduced to a chase after more bread, after more stuff. And Jesus calls attention to the meaningless of such a chase. And he begins to talk to them about a different kind of food. And so they respond in verse 28. How can we get this food? What work does it take for us to have it? And Jesus says, verse 29, simply believe on the one that God sent. Then in verse 30, the crowd says again, well, show us a sign like manna from heaven. So we'll believe. And in verse 32, Jesus basically says to them and to us, manna is minor. And by the way, Moses didn't give it. True bread comes from the Father. And so the crowd responds in verse 34, that's it, that's what we want. Give us this true bread. And Jesus says it this way, verse 35, don't miss it. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, 
and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will, verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father. Verse 40, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus emphasizes over and over in this very small passage the spiritual nature of life and the meaningful life that is to be found in the one who is the bread of life. Yes, he has taught them about the possibility of not hungering and not thirsting ever again, of life that not only has meaning, but life that is eternal. It is the truth that the French philosopher Pascal affirmed in a quote that most of us can at least paraphrase. There is within each of us a God-shaped vacuum that cannot be filled with anything that has been created. It can only be filled with the Creator. There is within all of us a God-shaped vacuum that cannot be filled with anything that has been created only with the Creator. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am your sustenance. If you want to live and live forever, take of this bread. The East Tennessee version of the Pascal quote is very simply this. The hole in your soul cannot be filled with a loaf of anything that you can hold in your hand. The hole in your soul cannot be filled with anything a loaf of anything that you can hold in your hand. It can only be filled by the power of God through Christ Jesus. If you don't know that power, if you don't know that forgiveness, if you don't know that love, if you don't know Christ Jesus today, I invite you to come to Jesus and to know him. God provides our every need. So the second point, very simply, God's provision is extravagant and extraordinary. God's provision is extravagant and extraordinary. And so I'm just mentioning in the way of application this morning some modifiers that we can apply to the way that God meets the needs in our life. He is extravagant and his provision is extraordinary. So mark down these words. God's provision is unimaginable. Unimaginable. God's provision is beyond anything we can imagine. It cannot be computed. It cannot be calculated. It's beyond anything we have ever seen or dreamed. Uh, Jesus said to Philip, how much money will it take? Philip said it can't be calculated. It simply can't be done. We cannot do it. But God says, through Christ Jesus, you can't imagine, Philip, what you're about to see. You cannot imagine what I am about to do. God's provision, God's grace is unimaginable. We cannot wrap our minds around it. Unimaginable, yes, and also, don't miss this, unconditional. 
God's provision, by the way, is not dependent upon what we bring to his party. It is not based upon what we want or what we need. God's provision is based upon only what he has chosen to give us. When we read this gospel account, we make much of the fact that this boy had his lunch and he brought his lunch and he gave it to Jesus. We make much of the boy in the story and that is certainly something that should be praised. But here's the truth. Had it been one fish and no bread, God would have still done what God did. Because the provision is not based on what was available. The provision is based on who God is. So the provision of grace in your life and the provision of mercy in your life is, is not conditioned by how much grace you bring to God or how much mercy you bring to God. It's how much grace and mercy he has available to you. It's unconditional, unimaginable, unconditional. Oh, don't miss unconventional. God's provision, not always delivered in conventional or expected ways. Think about it from the disciples' perspective. The disciples needed to be delivered from the temptation to join a revolution. That was their need. How did Jesus meet their need? He put them in the boat and sent them into a storm. Somewhat unconventional. Somewhat. Think about other biblical examples. When you're thinking he didn't want them to be tempted, so he sent them to a storm. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He did not want them to be tempted. He did not want them to give in, so he sent them to a furnace. Think about John. This John who wrote this gospel who was undergoing persecution. God didn't want him to undergo persecution, so he sent him into exile. Somewhat unconventional. We scratch our heads, but what we know in our hearts is that as God acts, he always acts for our good and to reveal his glory. Unimaginable, unconditional, unconventional, unfathomable. God's provision is beyond our comprehension. If you look at all of the dialogue in verses 22 through 31, it raises questions in the human mind that simply indicates that all of these things Jesus is saying to this crowd and to us, we just don't get it. We don't really know who God is. We don't really know what God wants from us. And sadly, our inability to accept God's plan leads some of us to turn away from him. We explore, we study, we learn. But what we're trying to do is take an infinite God and place him in our finite hands and it just cannot be done because he is unfathomable and finally don't miss it God's provision is unsurpassable there is no greater need in our life than eternal life there is no greater gift to our life than eternal life at the initiative of the Father, through obedience to the Son, Jesus has provided our salvation in his death. He has prevailed over sin. And it is an 
absolutely unsurpassable provision. Jesus meets our needs, all of our needs, our ordinary needs, our needs in the midst of a crisis, and our spiritual needs. And with a grace and a mercy that is unimaginable, unconventional, unconditional, unfathomable, and unsurpassable, he offers himself to us. He offers himself to you today. He is the bread of life. Come to Jesus and receive it. May God bless his word to our lives. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for a word that is beyond our comprehension and for a word that speaks life into our lives. We pray that even in this place this morning, there might be someone who would receive the word of life, who might come to Jesus, who might accept the grace and the forgiveness that he offers. We pray, Father, for all of us that we might affirm in our spirits and in our hearts this morning that you are indeed our daily bread and our eternal bread. May we celebrate as we sing in Jesus' name. We stand with me as we sing our hymn of commitment, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Sing with me, please. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Thank you for coming this morning. May the Lord bless you as we prepare to leave this place. So grateful for our deacon chairman, Con Ellis, and he's going to come and lead us in a word of benediction and a word of blessing for the offering just before our closing song. If y'all don't know, we have two boxes right there and right outside this door where you can leave your offering. So thank you for your word today, Pastor. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the uh, privilege to be here today. Lord, it's our responsibility and privilege to tithe. Lord, we ask your blessing on the tithes that we receive today. And Lord, as we leave today, give us a joyful heart uh, knowing that you love us and we love you. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Our choir sang a song last, last Sunday, We Will Remember. We're going to ask you to join us just a little snippet of this thing. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember of your hands we will stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness sing it again please we will remember we will remember we will remember the works of your hands we 
will stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness i want you to remember that all day long you're dismissed